just just by way of introduction, my name is Mike Beckema, and we're in Corinth, Mississippi, and today is November 7th, 2013. Tell me your name. My name is Max Butler. I'm a local 40, uh, 74-year-old resident, so I've spent most of my life here. And, and Max, you, you know I'm recording this now, right? I'm making a video, and that's with your permission. It's okay to do yes, that? Yes, sir. It certainly is. Okay. And you live in Corinth now? Yes, sir. First of all, tell me about your family. How long have they been in northern Mississippi? I understand that uh, the tracing that we've done, uh, the Butlers came out of the Carolinas in about 1934. And some of them dropped off here and in Tennessee, which Tennessee is just three miles away. So sure. along the Tennessee line. And some of them went on to Texas. So we're, we're, an, old, we're an old family. Back generations yes, sir. here. Uh, you mentioned your father earlier. Tell me about your your dad. Well, my father was was probably a third generation moonshiner. Excellent. And because uh, he died in 1961, which the moonshining business had had begun to to subside then. Okay. It wasn't as lucrative as it was in the probably the 40s and the 50s. Uh, it was a little more. It's a little more dangerous to do, and it was uh, not as rewarding as it was in the earlier days. And when I was a child, my first job as a was a, probably a eight or nine year old boy, and I would take bottles from the Nehigh plant, gallon jugs from the Nehigh local bottling company, and wash them out and prepare them for the next shipment, the next production of moonshine. Mm -hmm. And as a kid, I just didn't think there was anything more fun than being out in the woods, out in the countryside, with a branch dammed up for a water supply and uh, seeing the, the, the operation of, of a moonshine still. And later on in my career, I ended up uh, learning to run a hydrometer, which is tells you the specific gravity of a substance, and it tells you what proof the whiskey is. And if we'll get on into the manufacturing of it a little later. I'm not going to be mm -hmm. too. I'm not going to spare you anything because uh, this is a dying and vanishing art, mm -hmm. and there has been some revival in it in the television programs, which is kind of neat and. I do watch them. I watched one last night. I'm familiar with Joe Bob and Tickle and that crew out of the Appalachian. But it and it's there's a little difference. I pick out some little things in their their television program that's entertainment. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's been a, a resurgence in it, and I'm just yes, I'm glad that I was there when it. I was I was there when I was just a, a kid, and uh, mm -hmm. you have to. Keep your mouth shut, because when you get to the chemistry classes of, as, in high school, you can't tell them. Uh, I've seen condensers like this, except on a larger scale, and uh, it's uh, like I said, it's a vanishing art. And the, the gallon jugs that we you, we call them ring neck gallon jugs. That that's what you put your pretty pro product in, and it's relatively simple to make to manufacture moonshine. Mm -hmm. uh, You'll require a water source, and that's always uh, you dam up a branch, a little brook, and build you a little reservoir. And then you uh, take you a barrel. We most of the ones I'm familiar with was a 55 gallon drum. Clean it out and dig you a fire pit underneath it, an earthen fire pit. Because this was back when I was involved with it, my family was involved with it. It was back before the propane gas bottles and the, the gas, so we we were wood fired. And strangely enough, about the wood firing, you had to go out of the neighborhood to cut your wood. You couldn't cut your wood around the it's close to the still because you had to use that for coverage. You had to use that foliage and the woods to keep it as stealth as you possibly could. Mm -hmm. And uh, once you've got your your kittle dug into the your 
earthen fire pit, you take barrels, clean barrels, and you put sugar and corn and you put yeast in there and in about three or four days in the summer it will convert into a beer because the, the sugar in the corn converts into alcohol. Mm -hmm. So you will have a mixture of say 10% alcohol and 90% other things, water and corn and stuff. And you take the drain off the or dip off the beer a good moonshiner can reach down and smell and check to tell what how it's running. And that was something that was so artful that some of the older people that worked around the stills in this business could tell you without any without any instruments whether it was ready to cook or whether when it would be ready to cook. And you get this beer, this mixture of probably about ten percent, which is about five proof because alcohol, 100 proof alcohol is 50% alcohol and 50% something else. <laughs> so you take this beer that you have produced and you put it into your kettle and you by this time you're building a fire and you start, you put your cap on it which is usually we used a 40 gallon wooden stay barrel with a pipe about a two inch pipe, copper pipe that came out of it and went to what's called a thump gag, which was a thing for extracting the impurities out of the, because steam with an impurity will drop. Sure. And uh, then you flows out of that into about a three quarter or one inch copper tube that's in a, that's coiled quite, mm -hmm. just round and around. You put it in a, a water box. It's usually a box built out of wood you think a, a box built out of wood wouldn't hold water, but once you build it out of dry wood and wet it, it expands and it's, it's quite, quite uh, contains the water. Mm -hmm. And then you have a hole in it where your, your tube, your condenser, we call it the worm, where the worm sticks out and once you start heating that, it gets up to a hundred, see alcohol converts to a vapor at 173 degrees. Okay. Whereas water takes it to 212 degrees to convert to a, a liquid. So you've got that area between 173 and 212 that you evaporate the alcohol. Alcohol evaporates and as gases float to the top, flows up into the cap, the top of your steel, then it flows over to your thump keg where it, and it'll make a thumping sound, thunk, 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 thunk. And it flows out and then it, and it, then when it goes back through this water box, which has got cold water from a little crystal clear little brook, it will condense the alcohol vapor back into a liquid. And it usually starts off at about 180 proof, which is about 90% alcohol. And as you watch it, and the old timers could take a jar and shake it and look at the beads and could be within a, a proof or two of what it actually was by just simply looking at the beads. And uh, so you uh, start off at 180 proof and then you start blending it down and blending it down and as you run it you're depleting the alcohol and you're using uh, steam, which is uh, distilled water, and you when you get it down to about 100 proof, you cap it and take it to market. <laughs> and, and it's a clear liquid at that Clear point. as a crystal, crystal clear, and, okay. and relatively odorless. Is it at that point distilled water and alcohol? Yes sir, it's about uh, on, a, on a 100 proof, which is a comfortable I don't drink, so I, I'm a, okay. I, my family said that stuff made to sell, not to drink, boys, to keep pouring. <laughs> <laughs> so, as a matter of fact, this humorous things have happened in the family. I've said back during the war, with, nobody could get sugar, mm -hmm. but the family had the, had the coupons, had the sugar ration, ration Ooh. coupons, oh, and could get sugar. Mm -hmm. And I've seen furniture set out on the back porch 
to make room in the house for the sugar. And it's a hard, hard job. <coughs> you have to be off the beaten path. You cannot make it in public. You have got to go dense into the woods to, to make it, to keep. And with hunters like they are now, able to hunt and move around, this was back in the 40s and 50s, and there wasn't as much hunting going on as there is now. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a no deer population. Now we've got an abundant deer population. We had no deer hunters. Now we've got a deer hunters. But it's it was fascinating growing up and looking back over it. I uh, wouldn't take nothing for the for the experience. And uh, of course, Daddy had a first cousin that was legendary. His name was Leon Butler, and he was from a little town called Chihuahua, Tennessee. And uh, he manufactured moonshine for 36 years. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the sheriffs, now a lot of the sheriffs didn't, were on the, were, were paid off and they didn't bother you. Mm -hmm. And that was a very important uh, part of your manufacturing that you, law enforcement had to be a part of your program. And it was. Business partner? Yes, a business partner. Okay. Uh, you could get a steel tore up if you were late on your payments. So, this sounds like a family business. Well, it's family business. My, uh, there's always back in the 40s and we're talking about what 50 60 years ago 60 years ago mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about the old timers that were still that were uh, in their latter years that that enjoyed working it mm -hmm. and now also uh, for common labor in this at this time of the of history uh, an adult man could in the country unskilled cutting off uh, ditch banks and pasture fencing and pepping with hay baling it was like three dollars a day which, and a moonshiner could make could make uh, ten gallon a week mm -hmm. and probably profit get a ten, a ten gallon at ten dollars that's a hundred minus the about a dollar at that time to manufacture it so he's making ninety dollars a week when everybody else was making a lot less and would you, your father's operation was it pretty typical of other moonshiners yes sir as a matter of fact they were so fascinated with each other's with each other's uh setup that somebody had a all copper steel they caught it up in tennessee and had it on display in the hall at the courthouse and the family loaded up in the car and rode up there and climbed up the steps and went up to the courthouse in the outside the sheriff's office, and looked over that uh, copper, the copper steel, uh, uh, all copper steel, which was very fascinating. For yeah. So it sounds like any other family business. Yeah, way. that's uh, but uh, you wouldn't believe it. But uh, a lot of the people there was local businessmen that would take a gallon of high quality moonshine weekly okay it had to be about 110 proof some people actually wanted it a little warmer at 120 proof and that's when you would start blending it and you would set out a certain person's gallon then you'd blend it back down to 110 and have it for somebody else and mm -hmm. then there was there was what they call baseball whiskey what is that well there was a lot of athletic teams uh, locally in the, uh, on Saturday afternoons that would have every community had a baseball team mm -hmm. and you could go around a honky tonk so we had road houses and you could pick up half pint bottles okay. and you could convert that ten dollar gallon of whiskey you could run it down to where it was actually about 75 proof a real weak mm -hmm. liquor and you could come up with uh, 16 half pints out of a, a cheap gallon. You could get it down. You get back in the 40s, you could get whiskey down as low as four or five dollars a gallon. Now, the way they got around that beading part of it, where you shook it up and looked at the beads, they dropped a, a drop of oil in the the jug, and when you shook it, it beaded real good. 
but you were watching the, the oil on the beads. That okay. Did. It was just always, I look at things like fast cars and all that, and my family, when they delivered, they delivered in the worst car that you could get your, possibly get your hands on. That way, if they had a problem, donate it. Because if you had a good car, they would take it and, and actually park it on the courthouse lawn. I've seen people's cars parked on the... This sounds like a normal business. Were, were there lots of problems with the police or did it just simply go fairly well if you paid the proper tribute? Well, it was not that much of a problem. You want to be clandestine and naturally you want to be as quiet as you possibly can. But uh, you you still want to, uh, you, you, it's very impossible to do, especially if you hire other people to assist you. If you hire somebody to help you, you the worst thing you can do is have a staff, a production staff. And you'll have somebody that, that they'll ask him what he's, you usually have to get people that are relatively close to unemployed and a little on the lazy side. And if he, he'll be down at the store and he'll have a half pint in his back pocket and they'll say, where did you get that? And he said, well, we made it up the road there. We, you know, and so it doesn't take long. You gotta, you gotta go through a, a real vetting process to hire people. But it was, it was a part of my life that I, I moved on and I, like I said, I don't drink. I, and uh, don't have a problem with people that are responsible doing so, but. Uh, How was this sold? Would the, would, like your father, would he sell it directly to the to the consumer. consumer, yes, sir. Okay, so there's uh, no... there was a, a people that had that you could uh, you just delivered it to them. You carry them a gallon, and they give you ten bucks, and you go on to the next one, and mm -hmm. and you just uh, home delivery, but carry it to their businesses where they worked. Okay, this and, would be uh, after National Prohibition. Yes, sir. National Prohibition started in 1920, January of 1920, and lasted 12 years. But the, the time you'd be familiar with is after 1933. Right? Well, yes, sir. I, so, I, what's the attraction of moonshine versus um, a bottle of Jack Daniels? Well, today it's a curiosity. It would be a, a total curiosity mm -hmm. uh, because it was. It, uh, you can't just walk into Gary Briggs's liquor store and get you a fresh off the farm mm -hmm. quantity of this particular drink mm -hmm. it's it's and some people have a a real appreciation for the taste it's like some people drink vodka and some people drink gin some people drink brandy so they have a lot of people a lot of the old timers uh and we're talking see which there's two gaps here there's today and then there's back in the 40s and 50s mm -hmm. and and that team Fifty-three, they caught. We looked at the do the document there. Caught Ralph, a distant cousin. So fifty-three, he was killed in fifty-four, mm -hmm. and so about fifty-four, it got to where it was. You run out of places to hide your steel, mm -hmm. and it's it's just not it's just not worth the, the hassle and factory jobs begin to come into the area and people just kind of the the art the old the old timers were passing on and it's it's I guess I was kinda lucky to have been like an eight or nine year old kid to start off at a still washing jugs mm -hmm. and then seeing it firsthand. Sure. It, it's been and that's why, I, like I said, I watch those TV programs, and I do detect a few things that are a little I disagree with. You need to be a technical advisor. Well, I'm happy I'm a golf pro now, and I'm happy <laughs> I give lessons. And, <laughs> From moonshiner to golf pro. Well, it's a career art. It's, that, it is, so. I, but I'm I was never a moonshiner. I was just a moonshiner's son, and it was fascinating. And, and and a lot of people had didn't realize, you know, it was just a it was a way of life. You, you mentioned uh, Buford Pusser. Yeah, Buford was a local sheriff 
in the county four miles from here. And he became quite famous. Yeah, Buford became, and Buford was a friend of mine, by the way. Uh -huh. I'm a retired photographer from ITT, and I photographed Buford, took the last picture Buford ever had taken, uh -huh. uh, only about a block away from here. He was at a book signing. I had he, he signed my his first, I bought the first copy of his, of Bill Morris's book, and mm -hmm. we had a book signing, and I got my picture made with Buford, and mm -hmm. Buford was, Buford was Buford. He was glamorized in the movies. Right. I think Buford was, it was, I don't want to get off into, because Buford and I were friends. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't have a problem uh, with Buford. Mm -hmm. He was no different from most of the other sheriffs here. Mm -hmm. They said that at one time, the sheriff in Alcorn County was worth more than the governor, made more than a year in a four-year term than the governor. Mm -hmm. So that's a this. We have a lot of history, a lot of heritage. Sure. There's people that that make sorghum molasses. If you want to know a vanishing art, there's people that do all kind of things. There's things go on down here. They tell me they have rooster fights and. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, happens yeah, everywhere. That's just uh, the, like I said, the colloquialism and the, the color, and uh, we're all so much alike and yet so different. Mm -hmm. And it's now I have to ask. You indicated that Buford did your family a favor. Oh yeah, <laughs> Buford did have my family a favor. He killed my uncle Russ. We had a Russ Hamilton kill my aunt. I my, see. Uh, Russ married my aunt and then later on killing her and he went to prison and he threatened all of her sisters, had a bunch of sisters that testified in the court. Uh, matter of fact, right upstairs from where we are now. Mm -hmm. No, it was in McNair County. He, and they testified that they, he was the last person to be seen with her. So all the time Russ would get out of prison, he would always threaten them and come through the neighborhood, so they were all fearful of him. So one Christmas, him and Buford got disagreed, and Buford put him to sleep, <laughs> gave him a big Christmas present. <laughs> and the rest of the family, and, uh, too. It, so there's, I, Buford was, like I said, he was legendary. Mm -hmm. A lot of times a person like Bill Morris can take a typewriter and make a legend out of Dang near nothing. <laughs> was he, in your mind, just another sheriff, another county sheriff? Yeah, he was just another sheriff. I, I, it was funny, and now that we're moonshining today, today's moonshining at the courthouse. But <laughs> Buford had uh, one thing in common among his dry, among his deputy sheriffs. Mm -hmm. They were all moonshiners. <laughs> every but every sheriff, every deputy sheriff that Buford Pusser had was an ex-moonshiner. Certifiably ex-moonshiner? Yeah. Okay. Of course, uh, like I said, uh, when you couldn't, if, if, you, if you had a need for it, there's always just, just across the state line mm -hmm. and that you could always obtain the product. And I, when I was a kid, I knew them all. I played in the yard with their kids while sure. the daddy and the dad, my, my daddy and their daddy was Negotiating and loading up and all that. It was. We just didn't think nothing about it. It was just, sure. just part of it. And one thing that that we noticed um, where we live in Washington now, there's a there are a number of what would be considered artisanal whiskey makers and vodka makers and things like that. Are people legitimately going back to? Do that sort of there thing are state here. laws, and currently in, in the state of Mississippi, when Jimmy Carter okayed it, we were allowed to manufacture a uh, 200 gallon of wine per head of a, per head of a household. Okay. And uh, in certain states, uh, now like my cousin that I was telling you about, Leon, that was the legendary 36 years, he got arrested and put in jail, not a state prison but a federal prison, and they got him for evasion of income tax. They based it on an appro uh, uh, appra approximation of what he had what he had manufactured and failed to, to 
pay the income tax on. Okay. He got two years in Montgomery, Alabama, the federal prison. Of course, there was, I think there was three of them that went. Buddy Derryberry and somebody else went with them, maybe Randy, maybe Randy Coates. But they all got sent to federal prison for not making whiskey, but failing to pay income tax or pay tax on federal manufactured time. liquor. Wow. So it was... It was and and now you're in golf. Oh, yeah, I play golf. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. I'm a pro at a local nine-hole golf course, and I work with junior golfers. Mm -hmm. I've turned out one All-American. I've turned out several college golfers. I'm currently involved with a little girl that uh, was a state Coca-Cola Tour champion. I got one boy at Northeast. I had a boy at Northeast, and he dropped out. And uh, I've got one 13-year-old just got back from a mission trip to Malaysia and he's going to be the best I've ever turned out. Excellent. A little redhead boy. Half, he's, a, he's, a, he's a nice kid. He's got a little larceny to it. He likes to gamble with the older people. And, well, a little larceny is yeah, good for all like, of us. Yeah, I like that. I carried him to a pro. Gene Howard is Boo Weekly and Heath Slocum and uh, all, Henrik Stenson and all those guys teacher. Mm -hmm. I carried him. He said, boy, he's got a good swing, but he's got a bad attitude. And I said, don't you love it? <laughs> but uh, I would, uh, like I said, most of the, most of, the, I've noticed that the boys in the, on the television program making moonshine put it in plastic jugs, which that's basically against our religion. Okay. Uh, we use glass jugs. If you can't find a gallon glass, gallon jug, get you four quarts. So it's a, uh, what else do they get wrong? Big parts. What else do they get wrong? Uh, I, I don't know. It they they are. We never did mix fruit and vegetables and all that stuff into our manufacturing. You're white lightning. Yeah, white lightning. These guys last night they got a a, a dump truck load of strawberries. It's gonna make strawberry brandy, and I'm thinking. Red strawberry wine. <laughs> so it's there. There's some, and some of the setups. Uh, they they had left some equipment in the woods over the year. He left it there. It, it's I just you know, I'm I guess I'm biased, but I just laugh at what what I see. Like to do it right, Max. I'm gonna unless you have a question. Ed. No, this was fantastic. I'm gonna turn off the camera. Well, I was a pleasure. It's always, you know, this is a hospitality state, and we've always said, come on down to Mississippi and we'll treat you so many ways. You've got to like one or two of them. <laughs> I like them all, well, actually. Now, how long are you going to be in town? Uh, we're going to be here in Corinth through uh, Friday night. Saturday, we're going down to Oxford. Okay. And Now, we have... Uh, our, uh, let me, again, you understand I've been recording this, right? Yeah, I do. And that was with your permission. Did I... Thank you very Did much. Did I put on a pretty good show? Yeah, you put on the best show of the, the week. Will I have the ability to get a copy of this? We yes. Can. But now I'll tell you another thing that we, we have here. Thanks again. I'm going to turn this off if Go that's ahead. okay.